Okay, good afternoon. Um, so, how are things? Good. Good. Um, so today I'm going to try to do the demo of like three different concepts of media server, right? Um, the first one we'll we'll look at is something which broadcasts live streams and. Right, so I'm going to talk about how you, you know, one of the, um, an example of a live streaming system, an example of a system which stream stored contents, an example of something, um, what I would call a modern media services, right? And i never done this before, and one of the, the reasons why people don't do demos, if any of you have done demos, right? Things never work when you try to demo, right? And it's, it's always embarrassing for, um, I haven't done this for long, but you, you, it's especially hard when PhD students who've been working on some project for like six years and then try to do a demo and the most basic thing fails and then uh, you feel like an idiot, right? So anyway, so with that caveat, right? And please feel to stop me at any point because you know, this is sort of an interactive thing, right? And there are many different examples of these kind of a systems. So I'm gonna show one which is more Mac-centric because I sort of use the uh, Macs on a day-to-day -day basis, right? The first thing I'm gonna show is the this application which broadcasts live streams. And it it brings up some of the issues that I asked on the you know, midterm in terms of how to encode a video in real time and stuff. So here, the idea here is I'm, I'm going to take a video using the camera built into the laptop, and I want to broadcast it, right? And so there are a lot of parameters you need to set for this particular application, and we'll we'll go through and see how that affects what 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 happens, right? So and I have a camera set up there, and of course I have to be here. So um, I need to set up set up the audio because there's a loop here, right? So I have a video source here. I, I set it up to. Um, I'm, I'm looking at my camera, and what I'm looking right now is the, the compressed image that is being sent out, right? Is the lighting okay? Maybe I just uh, look dark, right? Um, so, one of the things we looked at was trying to figure out what kind of a media, how, what, how to optimize, what's the quality that you want to set, and these sort of things let you set a whole bunch of uh, stuff, right? So, for example, for the audio, I can set up the audio to be tuned for certain certain setup, right? So, they call this dial-up uh, or, or what have you. But essentially, they're trying to figure out how much of network bandwidth I expect the the receivers to see this, right? Um, and and if you have any of a laptop, if you have a laptop and if you are able to view this uh, stream, that that's good. We can follow along too, right? So let's let's just choose that since it's a wired stuff. I choose a certain quality of video. I choose where the input has to be, and I have to choose a whole bunch of setting in terms of how what kind of a format I want to store this at, right? So let's let's leave it at MPEG4 audio, right? Um, and I do the same thing for for my video. So I've I selected the, the sort of the audio and the video format that I wanted, right? That's not the hard part. That's the part that you've already done for your homework project. The next part is, as a media server, I need to figure out how to transmit these videos such that you, as a, as a user, can uh, listen to it, right? So when I set up the network, what are the things that you would, you guess, you would need to know before the server can work? We need to know the network conditions. We need to know the net kind of network conditions that that would be between you and me, right? And we, we kind of did that when you were trying to do the setup of the video, so we, we sort of assumed that we all have good network connections or whatever. From a network perspective, 
the next real challenge is for you and I to know where we are, right? I don't need to know actually where you are, but you need to know where I am, right? So what you're trying to do is you want to look at the video that I'm going to broadcast from this machine, right? And for, for that, you need to know what's the machine name and what's the port numbers and all the network details, right? And we, we do this most of the time. So if you're, if you're using Notre Dame services for checking a web page, you, you go to www.any.edu or something and you expect to get the service. Here I need to figure out what kind of a, what, how I would be called in the network sense, right? So I can call myself, I can do automatic uh, broadcast, or I can do a manual setup, right? Which means that I'm, I'm setting up a, 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 a media server and I chose my local IP address, which, which is assigned to me by, by Notre Dame. And I'm going to send the audio in one, one network port, video in another network port. And I can set up a whole bunch of things here. I can, I can, I can put, give myself a name uh, 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 and, and all those things, right? Is that enough? The next step is I need to give that information to you, right? So to set up a media server, you have to, uh, the, the media service has to figure out what kind of audio they want to send, what kind of a video they want to send. And they also have to advertise the, the how these services are known to you. So in, in this particular case, if you look over here, this is the audio that we're going to be sending. This is the video we're going to be sending. And the I'm going to send broadcast it on that IP address, on that audio port, on, on that video port. So if you have a client, and if you can enter all this information manually, then whatever I'm going to broadcast should be seen by you, right? And in most most practical sense, those sort of things is annoying because you don't want to remember all this all this information. So that's one of the reasons why you develop the STP protocol, which I couldn't get to it in the last lecture. We'll see it in the next lecture. So essentially, you want to encapsulate all this information into a service se session protocol file. So I can give that to you and then essentially you know wh where I am, right? So let's, in this particular case, I can export my setting to STP file and I'll show you what how the file looks like. What does SDP stand for? Um, we'll, uh, the session description protocol, you describe the session, right? It's a text file, and is this font size big enough? Uh, so this is this is sort of the. Can you read this stuff? You don't have to go through the detail, but essentially, if you sort of look through the stuff, right? It basically tells tells the, you know the what IP address things are, what are the different streaming protocols and stuff, right? So all the things you saw on the on the GUI screen is encapsulated into this particular file. So when you go to a web page and, and looking for streaming videos, essentially the first thing that happens is you you get a STP file or, or something similar to that, right? So proprietary systems like multimedia, Microsoft Media may have a different format, but essentially they, get, they send you something which tells you everything about the network parameters that the server set up to, the, the IP address and all those things, the video parameters that the video was set to, the audio parameters they have set to. So if you look over here, it tells you something like, you know, it's MP4, MP4 video, and it tells you what, what profile and what's the bit rate and what's the frame size and all those things. So you as a client, when you get this video, would know whether this is good enough for you to watch, whether you can deal with that stuff, right? Now the next challenge is for me to give this file to you. So if, if you want to watch this particular stream, I would have to give this video to you in some sense, right? And in, in, in a normal sense, you would download it from a web page or, or I can give this to you, I can, I can copy this to you. Um, and in this particular case, since it's in my local file, I can, So 
So one of the players which can which can read this is this QuickTime. So QuickTime player right now is it's ready and it's uh, but I'm not uh, broadcasting anything. So now the loop is complete, right? So essentially, what I'm doing is I set up all the parameters that I wanted for my particular session, right? I figured out what my video should be, audio should be, what my IP address is and everything. And the next challenge was for me to give that information to, to the receiver. And that, so we need to develop some sort of protocol. STP is one protocol, but, but some, somehow I need to tell you that I'm on a particular IP address, I'm on all these parameters. And once I encapsulate, encapsulate that and give it to you, and essentially that client, now all it needs is that particular file, and it knows what my IP address is and everything. And so since right now, so this is broadcasting, and if you look over here, I don't know if you can see it from the, from the back, it tells you the, the, the data rate that is, it's achieving right now you know, for the video, for the audio, and the CPU load, and a frame rate that it's getting, and, and so on and so forth, and the video is actually you're seeing over there, right? And this is on a single machine, so you, you should expect to see a good quality. Um, except one of the things that we'll, we'll see later on is the notion of buffering, right? And you, you, you would see that, um, suppose in this case, right? So if I point my hand, right? See how, how, how late it takes for, for so if you look at this screen, right, the, the one on the top corner, right, this is the client right now, right? This is the one that is actually seeing my video. This is where I'm broadcasting. You will notice that there is a, enough of a delay for, for the live stream to happen, right? So if I walk in, right, you see enough of a delay, right? And that's another challenge that you would have to face. In this particular case, it's sort of okay, but if it's if it's some other if you're doing a video chat kind of stuff, that amount of delay would would not be acceptable to you, right? The other thing that you I don't know if I can show it on on the demo is the notion of so if you, I'm sending the audio and video packets on two different networks, right? I'm, I'm sending it on one port for audio, one port for video, which may or may not be acceptable from, from a user perspective, but the challenge now becomes the synchronization of both of them, right? I want to make sure that if I say something, the synchronization should be between the audio and the video, and that's very, very hard to achieve because these are two independent events. The audio is getting its own timing, video is getting its own data, and making sure that they are synchronized, it's, it's very hard, right? It's very hard for all these systems, and we'll, we'll see some of, some of why it becomes harder as we, as we in, in, in the next couple of lectures. And if you, if you ever looked at the lecture videos closely, you will notice that the video is not actually synchronized to the audio all that well, right? The lecture video that you're seeing, because what happens is the, uh, I'm using a wireless microphone, which connects over a Bluetooth to that, head, to that thing, right? So this one adds a little bit of delay. So if you look over there, you'll see that I'm actually, my, my mouth will move faster than the audio because there's a slight delay, right? It's sort of okay as long as you're not looking at my face and you're trying to lip read, lip read me while you're listening to the sound. But that's, that's again a big challenge in these kind of systems because what may happen is I may come over here and say, hello, and then I kind of leave, right? If, you, if audio is not fully synchronized, then all you hear is you see me come in, go away, and then you see the hello afterwards, right? It's very hard to show this stuff because there's so many audio feedback loop going through. Um, uh, let me see. Okay, there's a feedback. Um, hello? Hello? Hello?
हेलो हेलो यू कैन हेयर कैन द स्टेकर्स राइट हेलो 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 ओके ओके इट्स प्रीटी लेट ओके या योर योर सिंग It's kind of hard because there's a feedback loop between the speakers and the microphone here, right? Um, so if I can leave this room and then if you have a video here, you could you could face feel the difference, right? But this machine is not not exactly a uh, like a weak machine. I mean, this was um, sort of the top of the line like a couple of years back. But you, even here, you can see the the the, the compute requirements means that the frames per second that I'm getting is not that much, right? I'm not setting it on any network at all. It's essentially playing from here to here, and so you would expect the things to be as fast as possible, right? If any anyone of us, if you want to see the stream from your laptop, um, I love those uh, choices. <laughs> um, I don't know if it crashed, but if any of you who have a laptop, you know, if you can go to that URL, right, www.cscnd.edu slash tilde 7 slash csc40373.sdp. Um, you can see the
Are you able to access, is Hussain able to access that stream? Can you guys see it or? Yeah, I have no idea why it's not thing. Uh. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if there's any firewall between these two, right? Um, it seems to have pick up, picked up some. So if you look at the, the, what it knows about this particular stream, right? It interpreted some of the stuff. It knows the, um, the, the stream is coming in 160 by 120. Um, but data is not coming through, right? So if you, have a, if you have a laptop, so this is one way for me to be able to broadcast myself because I, I, I put the stuff. So I need to tell you where the STP file is, and, and that gives you a, a way to get the content. So now what happens is this is being uh, unicast. Basically, all the tra traffic goes from my laptop to uh, whoever wants to watch this stuff. Another way of sending this is through multicast, which I'm pretty sure that the these computers are, are blocked from using multicast. The idea here is if I want to, let me stop the broadcast. Another way is to multicast, but the, the idea here is once I do a multicast, all of you will, will get, so I'll only send one, one stream, right? And, and that's, that's sent on the network to as many users as who wants to join the stream. So in the multicast, I need to figure out what my IP address is and what my port number is. So uh, you know, in this case, I generated randomly some two IP addresses. So I created an IP address for me uh, for the audio side and the video side. Now I need to create another STP file which will encapsulate all these parameters, right? You'll encapsulate that I'm sending a MPEG-4 video, MPEG-4 MPEG audio, MPEG-4 video. I'm gonna be sending the audio from this IP address, this port number, video from this IP address, this port number. I'm pretty sure that the, the, the MPEG streams are blocked because, because I can get it from my office, right? So if I could do that, then essentially I can, I can scale it up to a large number. Because if all of you want to listen to this video, all I would have to send it is one packet from my computer and the network would, would send it to different people, right? So, you know, it, it's a simple service. I'm not doing anything complicated, right? The software is giving me all the parameters in terms of MPEG and all those things. But setting it up and running these things are not as simple as you would like because I still have the problem of telling you where these contents are. And if I have to change something, so at this point, I changed the way I'm, I'm broadcasting this stuff. So the old STP file that you had is no longer useful because I'm no longer on that particular address, right? And if I go from here to my office, I get a new IP address, so I need to get a new STP file, which I have to give it to you, and you have to go from there, right? Uh, and as you can see, even on this machine, the delay is, is quite, quite high, and the quality, what's, what's the video? Um, so you're sending the, the video at 160 by 120, which is not big, um, and frames per second is six. So if I, So I was trying to send it at 30 frames per second, 640 by 480 um, uh, video. And you will see that the frame, frame, frame rate that I'm, I'm achieving is, right now is 30, right? And that's because for MPEG stream, 
this is sort of very easy to, to encode, right? Because there's, there's nothing, there's, there's no motion. So it's, it's easy to deal with it. So if you look at the CPU load that, it, that I'm, I'm placing here, right? And so it's a two CPU, uh, two core machine. So you see that it's, it's between 60 and 40. So it's like 100% of the CPU just to encode this particular stream, right? So if I move in, right? You see that the video data rate would go up, right? The, the second, this component, right? This component will go up because now, now, now there's more motion and you see this thing go up and my CPU is not able to keep up with the frame rate, right? So I'm, I'm only able to make, manage like 24 or, or what have you. Um, and that's, that's another challenge with these things. And that's one of the reasons why I was asking you in, the, in, the, um, in your midterm, right? If you want to do this in real time, if you want to do the MPEG-4 in real time, then you have to change the, the way you're doing stuff because your, your, your CPU is not able to keep up. So you have to figure out you know, which, so you, you have to constantly be aware of what CPU load you're placing and be able to choose between whether you want to do I-frame or B-frame or P-frame, right? Many of you pointed out that B frames cannot be used because that's that was also asked in a previous question. What is you know why do why do we not prefer B frame right? Uh, because B frame means that you have to look back and forth and it's, it's computationally intensive. But you may also have to worry about whether you want to do high frame or P frame right? You can ignore the B, but even within the high and P right, I is fairly compute intensive. It's not as efficient for compression. But it's fairly simple because you take each frame, you treat them independently, you can encode it. But when you're doing a P frame, you have to figure out, you have to look at the previous and, and, and you have to do all the motion prediction, all those things. So when you're doing a streaming like this, you have to decide whether you have enough CPU power at that particular instant to do a P frame, or maybe you have to drop the P frame, go with the I frame or what have you, right? Because right now it's doing 30 frames per second, sort of what I asked for, but it's kind of, kind of not that interesting. You should be able to see the change when I walk in, right? Yeah, so it's not, right now it's achieving like 10 frames per second and then and moving up, right? So, so that, 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 that's the challenge, right? So, um, so when, you're, when, you're, when you're talking about large-scale media services, you have to worry about how to do the CPU and how to do all, all, the, all this setup, right? So that's, that's, that's the, the first component. The second component is trying to, trying to uh, stream a, a existing content, right? So in that, con that con context, I don't have to do the uh, MPEG encoding and stuff. I, I have all the stuff done, and, and the challenge is only to send those stuff, right? Then again, there are many different kinds of media servers. Um, one, of the, one of the media server is, is QuickTime uh, server, which I installed on this machine. So essentially, here the goal is I have the content. The server doesn't have to do anything else. It just has to send the stream. It doesn't have to do the encoding and everything. It knows the video. It, know, it has to send the content out, right? But you still have the problem of telling telling everybody where where I am, what kind of network parameters I'm using. So I still have to use HTTP file, but I don't have to I don't have to worry about the encoding parameters. So I'm going to stop this application. The way um, Microsoft Media does the same thing. So if you buy Microsoft server, uh, they, you know, the, it comes with the Microsoft Media uh, server built-in. If you buy the QuickTime server, uh, sorry, the Apple Mac OS X server, the, the, the media server comes in. So essentially at this point, it's all, it, all you have to tell it is what content you want to stream and, and the network parameters, right? So you, can, can, you, um, you configure it using a web server, uh, um, web interface. So in this con, they, they particularly call this playlist, right? So I can create playlist. So what I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm, I'm creating a HTTP file again called csc40373.stp, right? I have to tell it what media I want to be streaming, right? In this content, I, I have like a four different, uh, four different videos and 
I'm, I'm saying keep playing that over and over again because that's, that's a easy way. So essentially, I'm going to be doing the live streaming of a stored content. And I'm saying that this particular stream has to have these four videos over here. And, and again, you can figure them in different, different fashion depending on the particular tool you're using. And so once I do this, if you can access the, the particular STP file, you would get these, the, the four videos on your right. right? And so here within the within the the server, I can set up all kind of stuff. I can say where my media files would be, and what kind of a network uh, I, I I have, and you know the network parameters that I want to use, and the and I actually set up the server to use the port 80, right? So what that means is I should be able to go here and if I go to that address, right, that's where my particular server is. This is a local host and so this is a particular video that is being broadcast from the server. It's actually uh, animation. Um, but for some reason, it's kind of stuck. So this is the video um, that I'm, I'm broadcasting. And if you look over here, this is sort of what the, the parameters that of the video that, that you're receiving, right? Um, it's not surprising that you're getting good quality because it's essentially going from the local machine to the local machine. It's not doing any CPU encoding. It's just basically serving the video, right? It's not letting you download. It's actually being streamed in, in real time. And, and, the, and the quality is fairly good because it's, it's, it's a local stuff, right? So when you talk about a media server, uh, like a YouTube and all those things, essentially they're, they're doing something like this, right? They have a bunch of videos somewhere. They have to configure these servers to figure out, tell, tell where things are. Um, you still have the notion of trying to figure out what that STP fi file is. STP are some mechanism to tell you where, where it is, right? So when you talk to YouTube, the first thing you, 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 you go to YouTube, you download the Flash Player, right? The Flash Player will, will in turn ask YouTube, what video, where the video is, and it get, it'll get this STP file, which will tell it where the different contents, where the audio and video streams are. And it shows to you in a fairly uh, integrated fashion, so when you go to YouTube, you don't notice all these interactions going on, but essentially you need all these interactions to figure out what the stream is, right? And you can, you can, you can see how difficult these things are in terms of the computation uh, and the uh, setup requirements, right? And the start of the state of the art is it's not, it, this is the state of the art of, of how you, you can stream this stuff, right? It, um, it's, do you think it's easy to set up a, a media server like this or is it hard to set up one? So this is, this is sort of the art of the, state of the art, right? Um, so how would you use this kind of a technique to broadcast some video of, of something? So say, for example, like you want to say broadcast um, some event that that happened, right? And uh, how how would you how would you enable this? You you need the software, right? You need the software to make this happen. You need some server sort of network connection. You need to know all those details about what kind of a video you want to send, you know, MPEG and and, and all those things. And you need to be able to tell all your all your friends that um, where the STP file is, so they can watch this stuff, right? Would that be enough for for you as a normal user to stream content? What 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 is missing is you can see that my laptop is basically dying to service me, and I'm the only one who is watching it. I'm, I'm not sure if any of you else is is watching the video on this machine, right? 
one server is basically killing the, I mean, one particular task is, I mean, now the quality is, is good enough, right? But if you have like a few more users coming into this stuff, it's gonna, it's gonna bring the machine down because of the resource requirements, right? So what I would really like is to build them on a real server, not my laptop, but on a real server, right? But, but then a real server may service maybe 10 users and then, and then that's not good enough, right? Because you know, the number of users can be large. So what I really want to do is be able to scale to a very large number of servers that I, that I wanted, right? So one way to do that, so media servers, all the things we talked about is for a single machine, I can, I can do this kind of services, but if I want to scale it to a large number where I want to broadcast, say, the Notre Dame game to a large number of users, I need to be able to bring lots of servers, right? So the, the way the modern systems deal with that is the modern media server servers. So, and the way they do that is through using virtual machines. How many of you know about virtual machines? We kind of alluded to them in the operating system class, right? So the idea here is the hardware supports the, the particular uh, system to run another operating system internally, right? You get hardware assist. So what you do is you store all the all the information that is required for a new operating system into, let's say, a file, right? And you run your PM software on this file, and essentially you can boot it up into a particular environment, right? So you can you can install on the Mac, you can install Windows or what what have you, right? So what I can do is I can create this file. Install a new operating system, let's say Windows or wherever I, I want my particular uh, software to be, and I install the media server on that one, right? And then I can store this file. So if I want to create two instances of the media server, I essentially take this file, create two copies, and I, I let the program run on it so I can get two of the server, right? And that's that's the that's the goal you, you want to do. So if you want, if I suddenly need 10,000 servers, all I have to do is take one of these uh, server files or images. So I create 10,000 of these images, give them to 10,000 virtual machines, and suddenly I have 10,000 media servers, right? And that's the only way you can you can deal with all this stuff. The other way is like I can have all the, a, a form of 10,000 machines dedicated to this kind of st uh, stuff, but um, using it as a uh, you know, the virtual machine. The nice thing is I can just copy these files, create, creating as many clones as I want. So I can, I can scale up to whatever number I want uh, rather than installing a machine. So if any of you have installed machines, you realize that it's, it's kind of painful task to install one machine, right? So if your job was to install 10,000 machines with 10,000 uh, media servers on real physical machines, it takes a long time and, it, and you, you, want to do, um, you, you want to do this kind of stuff, right? So one of the there are many companies which offer this service. Most companies are moving towards this, this, this sort of a model. And one of the companies that we can sort of look at is the Amazon uh, EC2. I don't know how many of you heard of this stuff, right? So one of the, the best things to happen to allow people like you and me to get the kind of computing resources that we want is called Amazon EC2. It sounds like a sales pitch, but, but, but the idea here is it's a cloud computing service. What the nice thing is, they let you give them your your image. So you can give them your this this image <coughs> file, and they will run it for you. They charge you for the amount of CPU that you use, and the amount of network that you use, and the amount of storage that you use. Right. So if you don't use anything, you don't get charged. If you use a lot, you get charged. Essentially, they want your credit card, so they charge you to your credit card. Right. So there's no service level agreement. They don't promise anything. They basically they basically tell you that we'll give the service to you, right? The only the nice thing is Amazon itself runs on and on that particular machine. So if it's good enough for Amazon, it ought to be good enough for for normal users, right? So that that's 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 the model. So I'll I'll show you how the the virtual machine works just to give you a hint of how these things are. I'm going to start this one. So this is the, the, the spiel about the um, Amazon EC2. Uh, the corresponding service for storage is called S3, right? It's an elastic cloud, basically, basically it means that it can grow to whatever size you want. Um, I think the, the price works out to if you use 
one of the virtual machines 24-7, 365 days, it costs like $960 for a whole year, right? But if you only use it less than that, you pay less. And so it's pretty cost effective in terms of running these services. Um, so I'm gonna use a virtual machine software that I've installed on this machine. So I created a um, Red Hat Linux image file, the PBS file over here, right? So, so essentially now within the Mac, I'm running a um, Linux pal uh, virtual machine. So when you talked about quality of service and stuff, the real quality of service that we want to worry about is in this environment where things are much harder, right? So what we're trying to do is, the there is a Red Hat Linux inside here, and I have actually installed a um, real media server inside the Red Hat Linux, right? What I want to be able to do is run two of these instances on this particular machine, and I, I want good enough quality of service that each one of them can service media streams to do two different users, right? And I want to be able to manage my CPU <coughs> across these two virtual machines, right? The, the, the management is happening on the Mac. It has to give enough resources to the, to the virtual machine, such as the real time, the virtual machine will give you the real time quality that you want, right? All the things we talked about, we saw before in the, in the demonstration earlier in terms of the, um, the streaming, you know, the CPU constraints and stuff, you're gonna have it inside, that, uh, inside the virtual machine. And making sure that they, they all interact properly is not, is not solved at all, but, so essentially now we have the, um, So there, there is a, you know, there's a Linux machine. So I can install a media server or, or what have you, right? And if I'm happy with the media server, I can quit out of here, right? So essentially it froze my whatever, whatever screen you saw, right? Um, it's still freezing it, so you can see the the little thing still here, right? So I, do, I need to wait for this to freeze, right? Once it's frozen, the idea here is I would give one of this to say to Amazon, right? And if they want to, so, you know, if they want the capability to service more users, they, they so now the thing is saved, right? So when I start back again, he'll go back to where I was, right? I was at, I was at this screen when I went to sleep. So if you want a new machine, all I have to do is take the file instantiate it, and then it, it's in the state where it was, right? So it can service more of the, the clients, right? So if you go to the EC2 service, they, there's, there's a whole bunch of images for a number of different things, and you can have one for um, web servers and database servers and media servers and stuff. So one way to, to you know, going back to the example I, I, I asked you, like how would you service a large number of users? This is sort of one of the ways you can do that, right? You, you, you create a virtual machine, put all the servers that you, you want inside, and, and freeze them, and when you want more, more services, you dynamically start as many of them as possible. Um, and, but, but in terms of you know, making sure that the, the, the real-timeness is, is all serviced, it's not, it's not a trivial task, and that's, that's part of what the, um, that's sort of what is quite hard now, right? If you look at the research literature, most of the, the concerns are in making sure that you have all these, all these virtual machines. 
each one of these virtual machines is trying to stream a video, but they are asking resources from my real machine. Right? <coughs> so how do you make sure that the video that you're sending from this machine is good, you know, the, the service that you're getting on the, on the virtual machine is it's good enough for you to, to provide real-time service while getting all the flexibility of being mm -hmm. able to ship this stuff, um, being all the flexibility that comes with the virtual machine. Um, that's the challenge. Um, unfortunately, I, I couldn't get it. I couldn't uh, sign up to uh, Amazon to show show the stuff. And it's, it's I think it's fairly trivial. You need to uh, give a, um, a credit card and, and off you go. Um, but so that that's the sort of the state of where where things are, right? Um, Is this this is what you thought the media media service world was, or so again in this model, so in this model, right, in, in the virtual machine model, right? This is not really designed for real time streaming because real time streaming, the the in the first example I mentioned, you need. A camera, right? You need a you need a video source, right? Being able to send data to the video so from a video source to these devices and making them happen is not really the point of these services, right? Because you know, the, very rarely do you want ten thousand cameras to be sending ten thousand videos to ten thousand different users, right? What you're trying to do is have one video being sent to a large number of users, right? Um, so this is still serving stored video. From a large number of servers, right? In, the, in, the, in this case, scaling is pretty trivial because the file is stored somewhere. All you have to do is service this content, right? So if I want to have 10,000 different servers, each one of them running my own media server, right? Each one of them having the file, the actual media file, somewhere else, right? In the case of Amazon, you probably use S3 or something, and sending it off to different clients, right? How does HTTP play a role in this setting? <coughs> Remember, HTTP file tells you what kind of a video it is, right? What's the video parameters and stuff, which is constant for all these machines, right? Because it's all coming from the same file source, right? It also tells you what the network conditions are, right? Such as IP addresses and ports, right? IP address and ports will be different for each machine because these are all individual different machines, right? In this particular case, when I'm running this program, my virtual machine has its own name uh, other than what you see on the outside. So my laptop has IP address, my virtual machine has its own IP address, right? So this one has its own IP address, this one has its own IP address, this one has its own IP address, and so on and so forth, right? Which means that you need to have one SDP for here, one for here, one for here, one for here, right? And if I fork off and create another server, it'll get its own IP address and stuff, so it'll create its own SDP server, right? So you need another level of management to make sure that I give you the right STP file because that's how, so if I, if I see a client, if I see a request from you and I want you to go to this server, I would give you the STP corresponding to that particular server, so you'll go there, right? So if you're, if you're doing this to broadcast, let's say the uh, NCAA basketball games or something, you have a whole bunch of these things instantiated, but you also need a higher level mechanism on top of all the stuff, which keeps track of all the servers, keeps track of where they are, and it'll start this particular server, give it all the IP addresses, configure it, and then when you ask for it, I can give you one of the STP files. So if I give you a STP file for this particular server, you get contents from here, and I sit somewhere over here, I, I manage this stuff, right? So what will happen if this particular server crashes? What, is, what, what should you do? Can you reuse the STP file that you got? So you'll have to come back to me again, right? So once I know that things have changed, I cannot give them back to you. You might have seen these things happening, right? So if you have two or three friends sitting next to each other and you're watching video uh, sometimes, sometimes one of you will, will, will lose connection, right? It'll, it'll say something like connecting or, or what have you, but your friends will be okay. If you do a reload, things will be fine, right? 
Essentially, when you do a reload, you're coming and asking me what SCP file you should, I should use, and I, I can give you a new one. Right? If I don't give you a new one, if you still have the old one, you get stuck here. So you, you see your friends are not happy, but you're happy because you're getting a stream or, or what have you. Right? So essentially, the way you stream the, the you scale this stuff, um, so each one is getting their own little thing. Right? Each one is completely independent. This is because this, this whole application is trivially parallelizable. Right? Because essentially, you're getting the file from here and you're transmitting it. They're not talking to each other. They're not really trying to do anything else. Right? And one way to give quality of service here is, if, you are, if I like you, I can give you a good server. If I don't like you, I can give you a bad server in, in, at, this, at the STP level. Right? It's one simple way to give it quality of service. I can say these are good servers, meaning that they have good network connection, they have good memory, and all those things. So if I like you, uh, I, I want to give you higher quality of service, I give you a good STP file. If I don't like you, I put you on a lower STP, STP file. So essentially, the, the, the game changes from how to set up these servers to how to manage the, to tell you where to go. Right? And, and that's, 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 the, that's another important aspect of the whole process that um, somehow ha has to happen to make these things work. Right? And if, if all of them work, you would be happy because you're getting all this content. So when you think about it, you somehow has to store these files. Somebody has to set, set these up. Somebody has to instantiate all these things and, and manage all these things. And the state of the art is not that different from what I showed you. So you have to build this infrastructure to make configuration all these things happen. Uh, so the next challenge in, in the real world would be to make these things simpler and easier to manage um, and not requiring uh, advanced degrees to figure out what, what's happening, right? And, and that's, that's the challenge. Right? I'll, I'll see you on, on Wednesday where we can go through the HTTP file and, and, and the other notions of how to set up a network and stuff like that.